Hello everyone, today's video is about motion sickness, a very common problem. Well, like many things in life, motion sickness is a wide spectrum. It can be very mild, just a little bit feeling funny in your tummy, to very severe with bad headache, malaise, you feel warm, outright vomiting. Uh, it's been around a very long time, was first described by Hippocrates. In fact, our word nausea comes from the Greek word for boat. Isn't that fascinating? So it's really been around a long time and I wanna oversimplify it for you because that's how I kind of remember things more easily for myself. Think about your brain has to receive inputs, both visual inputs and vestibular inputs, your semicircular canals, your otolith organs in your ears, in your inner ear. This helps us uh, perceive motion and orientation and speed, right? Well, if your brain is getting conflicting information from your visual and your vestibular, it's going to have sometimes the consequence of motion sickness because you're getting this um, conflict, right? So let's think about how that could happen. Let's say you were sitting in the cabin in your cruise ship, right? Everything in the cabin is sitting still. Maybe you're sitting on your bed and you see the mirror. Everything is still. But your vestibular senses are crying out, we're moving or we're rocking or up and down. It's feeling this change in motion, right? So that's a conflict to your brain. Or on the other hand, maybe you were sitting still. You know, you don't have that sensation of motion from your vestibular organs, but you're playing this very vivid video game in which things are rushing and moving around. So your visual tells your brain that you're moving, but your vestibular doesn't back that up, so there's conflict, right? Motion sickness doesn't happen if you are actively moving. If you were just outside jogging, your vestibular system would feel the motion, your visual si system would confirm that there's no um, conflict then, right? So you don't get motion sickness then. It's when you're not actually moving, but you feel that you are from visual or you know that you are moving from vestibular, but you don't see the motion. So anytime there's a conflict, that's when you can get motion sickness. Now, a couple of things to tell you um, as far as who's going to get motion sickness. Usually, under two-year-olds don't get it, usually. It usually peaks on average around the age of nine and then the frequency gradually declines throughout adulthood. There are several things that can predispose you to motion sickness. For example, people who suffer from migraine headaches are more likely to have motion sickness. Women are more likely than men. There can be genetic factors, there can be hormonal factors. It's increased in pregnancy uh, for period, people on um, oral contraceptive pills and for people uh, on their period that the hormonal factors can increase the chances of the motion sickness. Um, here's another thing that is fascinating to me. It turns out, there were studies done on this, that if someone is expecting to get motion sick, they're more likely to get motion sick. So if you tell them, this boat is really going to be rocking, it's a very rough storm, you're probably going to get sick, and then they're put in the exact same conditions as another group who are told, this is pretty mild, I don't expect anybody to get sick. The ones who were anticipating getting sick are more likely to get sick. How about that? I think that's just wild. So there are a lot of um, predisposing factors, including expectations, right? Now, treatment is tricky, and so it's best if you can do things that are preventive, okay? So for some people in the car, it is helpful for motion sickness if they are in the front seat. It turns out that drivers are much less likely to get motion sickness because they are focused on the road. So if you can basically pretend, if you're old enough, be the driver, and if not, sit in the front seat and keep your eyes on the road as if you were the driver, and that can help. It doesn't help to read because then your eyes are in the same place, but your vestibular system is still sending you all this motion, right? Does that make sense? Um, if you were in a cruise ship, the lower down you can get your cabin, the less motion there will be, and that may help you somewhat. Now, if you know you have severe motion sickness and you know you have an upcoming cruise, then you may want to try scopolamine. Uh, it can come as a transdermal patch you put behind your ear and it can last 72 hours. Now, that's not practical for a short-term car trip. Um, the three... Uh, Factors in motion sickness that play a role are norepinephrine, acetylcholine, and histamine. And so for short-term trips, you may want to try something as simple, as cheap, as generic, as easily accessible as Benadryl. Now, the downside of both scopolamine and Benadryl are that they can be sedating. So you only use them if it's really significant motion sickness, not just extremely mild cases. I probably wouldn't bother. But, you know, Benadryl obviously has an antihistamine effect. That's what it primarily does. But it also, the reason it makes you sedated is it also has an anticholinergic effect. So both of those two things can help with two of the three 
players in motion sickness. So that makes sense. So I do recommend for a lot of my patients to use, if they know they have a long car trip and the kid's prone to uh, motion sickness, to use a dose of Benadryl before they go. Now, this isn't a, a sin or wrong or anything, even if the child's slightly sedated, that might make for a better trip if they could take a good long nap. But also they would just feel better because they wouldn't feel queasy and dread that long trip. Obviously also be prepared with towels and paper towels and, and maybe a bucket just in case the worst case scenario. But we were talking about those expectations. I wouldn't leave those things where they're visible for the child because if the child believes that you think they're going to throw up, then it's actually more likely to happen. So minimize it, distract them, talk about other things, take their mind off it. A cool wet washcloth can help sometimes, but um, try not to let them know that you're expecting them to actually throw up or they're more likely to actually do that. Um, the other things that I found interesting are some preventive options some people use, and there are some studies to back this up. Ginger candy can actually help prevent extreme motion sickness. So that's something that's worth trying. And also there are these acupressure um, bracelets that you can wear, and that can help some people not to have as severe motion sickness on car rides as well. So my hope for you is that your child will continue to outgrow this as typically happens, but hopefully in the meantime, these tips will help you. Preventing it and then using Benadryl before a long car trip can be just practical advice that I hope helps. Thanks.